as we're uh, voting for um, our staff members to be in the dunk tank, you may have noticed one's conspicuously missing. And so where's Kaylee? She's in the very back. Wave, Kaylee. Is our newest addition to our staff. And uh, she had some lame excuse about expecting another child to get out of the dunk tank. I mean, some people do anything to really participate. So that's her excuse, but I didn't want you to miss that. And uh, we have had a lot of fun connecting with our new staff. So Jason just came on board this summer and Kaylee as well. And then with Chris and Jody, I just want to tell you all, we are blessed with an incredible team uh, of staff right now that are all in and saying yes to what God has for us. And uh, we have a lot of fun together too, which is a, like an added bonus. And uh, staff meetings are entertaining always, especially if Jody and Chris are in proximity to one another. Um, but one of the things we've done, because we've had a couple of new staff persons on this summer, is we've just been taking some time to hear each other's stories, um, because we don't have a lot of history together. Jody and I have a little bit of history since second grade, but the rest of us, not so much history. And so it's been uh, just awesome to hear each person kind of share their heart and their journey of what God has brought them through. And uh, a few weeks ago, Kaylee was sharing some of her story and it just really, um, really impacted me to hear her share it. And so I wanted to, I asked her permission to share a little bit of it today. And just as a side note, if you haven't met Kaylee yet, she's a little more introverted, a little bit more introverted than Jason. <laughs> if you've met Jason, that was funny, yeah. Uh, and, uh, but Kaylee is a, a strong, compassionate Jesus follower and leader, and we are blessed to have her on our team, and so make sure you take advantage of the chance to get acquainted with her, but she was sharing a few weeks ago about her journey and um, the people that made a huge difference in her life, and so she, at her home growing up, there was a whole lot going on. Uh, her dad was alcoholic, and there was, it wasn't very stable, and just a lot of challenges uh, in her home life growing up. And she shared a few weeks ago just how it was the volunteers and the student ministry at her church that really made an incredible difference in her life. And uh, those volunteers and leaders kind of became her family that offered stability for her. And uh, she, she lived at the church during those years. And, and those folks that just chose to pour into her and walk with her through that journey and she was just sharing, you know, how if it hadn't been for those people who were willing to say yes to God's call, right, and to pour into people like Kaylee through those years, that, you know, she's not sure what, what her journey would have looked like, right? That they really were part of Jesus saving her life in a huge way. And she was sharing that in the context of a staff meeting where we were talking about um, how do we invite people uh, to, to serve and be a part of what God's doing. And this is, she shared that and she basically said, uh, uh, I don't get it. Like for her, because the people who served changed her life, there's not like a debate going on in her head like, should I serve? Should I be a part of what God's doing? Um, it it kind of, her response reminds me of elementary school. And um, in elementary school, when like the teacher would ask something like, uh, does anybody want to be the line leader to lunch? The, the answer is really obvious. But I was smart in elementary school. And I knew that if you said, me, you never got picked, right? It was a test of willpower, I think is what it was. And so she, they only picked people that were sitting in their seats, raising their hands, right? But... I didn't raise my hand like this. Did anybody else do this or am I just weird? I, I had perfected the art of raising my hand with my whole body, right? Like, did anybody do that? Like, you know, like about putting your arm out of socket, not saying a word because then you don't get picked, but like, pick me, right? I want to be first so I can eat, right? That's kind of a picture of what Kaylee was describing. Like when it comes to do I want to serve, do I want to be a part, like, pick me, right? Because I know what people made a difference in my life. And I think that's why she landed on staff. Like that was a step of faith for her to, to apply for this position and to jump into that. And uh, like everybody else in the room, there's a million reasons why she could have not done it. 
right? But it was that heart of, pick me. I want to be a part of what you're doing to change people's lives. And we've been in this series, Undone and Unleashed, in Isaiah chapter 6. This is our fourth and final week. And we're going to read this passage together one more time because it is Isaiah's experience with God that prompted Isaiah at the end of this passage to say, pick me, please, please, pick me. Here I am, send me. And uh, it's our fourth week reading this scripture, and I'm going to invite you to do something a little bit different. Uh, I'm going to invite you not to pull out your Bibles or read. You can pull it up on your phone or pull out your Bibles because you can look there again. But I'm going to ask you to close your eyes while I'm reading it. And I'm going to invite you to do this. I want you to try to imagine that you are Isaiah, all right? Just imagine that you are Isaiah in this passage. You're hearing and you're seeing what Isaiah, so just kind of put yourself in his shoes as you hear the words of the scripture for a fourth week in a row. In the year that King Uzziah died, and I'll just say as a side note, that's like in the midst of life happening, right? Somebody died, your, your work is hard, somebody's dealing with, like in the midst of whatever's going on in your world, imagine yourself like Isaiah. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up in the train of his robe, filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, each one had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your iniquity is taken away, and your sin purged. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? With your eyes closed still for just a moment, if you've been able to uh, at least imagine yourself a little in Isaiah's shoes, if you're Isaiah, what do you do next? You've had this vision. You've received, you've been undone, you've received cleansing. And then you hear God say, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. You can open your eyes now because I don't want you to sleep through this sermon. But that right there, that moment, after the vision of God, after being undone, after being remade by God's grace, and we hear God saying, who will go for us? Whom shall I send? That's the moment that I want to invite us into today. I want to invite us to, to think about how do we respond in that moment because we've been on this journey for four weeks and our prayer has been that God would bring us to that very kind of moment over and over again. For four weeks we've been unpacking this kind of big idea that when we are undone, and remade by God's grace, we will be unleashed. We'll, we'll volunteer to be unleashed to serve God's mission in new ways. Um, this passage of Scripture, it's interesting to me, in a lot of Bibles, I don't know if in yours, if, if there's a, a heading on it. Anybody have a heading in your Bible? Um, in this section, what it calls it? A lot of passage, uh, translations will call it Isaiah's Call. Anybody have that in your version? Um, I think it's a mislabel. 
It's a misnaming of this passage because we don't hear God call Isaiah. He doesn't say, Isaiah, I want you to come and do this. At least not up to the point where we've read right now, right? Isaiah sees God. He's undone. He experiences God's grace, this cleansing, right? And then what happens? Isaiah says, pick me, pick me, I'll go. I want to share good news with people who are dying. Pick me, here I am, send me. We we could maybe label it differently, like this is Isaiah's volunteering passage, right? Now, after he says, pick me, then God does say, go and tell this people, and, and so maybe that legitimizes calling it a a call so God does tell him to go after he volunteers but it's this encounter with God that changes everything and here's here's the big idea we want to unpack for today that volunteers like Isaiah and let me just give this disclaimer real quickly we we historically don't ever use the word volunteer I don't know if you noticed that but we prefer to use the word servant because volunteers are like people that um work at the PTO, and that's awesome, uh, or you're, like, you're beating the bushes trying to get people to do something good that they don't want to do. That's sometimes, anybody ever try to recruit volunteers, right? That's what it can be sometimes, right? And so we, we use the word servant because servant is it's about who I am and the things that I do, whether it's in the PTO or in the local church or in our community or whatever. It, it's coming out of who I am in Christ because I am a servant, therefore I serve. Um, but I couldn't get away from this word volunteer because that's what Isaiah does. And so this might be the only sermon you ever hear me offer where I'm encouraging you to be a volunteer, but I'm defining it very specifically in terms of volunteers like Isaiah, all right? So volunteers like Isaiah who say, here am I, send me. Volunteers live with a vision, a vision that is bigger than ourselves, and it's all... uh, caught up in this vision of God, and this vision of God then compels us to have a vision where we want to spread good news. We, we want to serve. We, we want to be a part of this work that God is doing to fill the earth with the glory of the Lord. Do you see that? Like, this is the vision. The whole earth is full of his glory. And when we have an encounter with God like Isaiah, then we stop Um, we stop waiting for uh, an email from God or a skywriting plane to leave us a message in the sky or we just say, I see a need. I see people that are living and dying without the hope that I've found in Jesus. Pick me, Jesus. I want to be a part of offering hope. I want to be a part of your work of restoration in our community. I want to see families and lives transformed and restored by you. Pick me. I want to be a part of it. Something bigger than myself. Um, This church is full of people who who have chosen to be volunteers, like Isaiah. This church is also full of people who haven't yet really taken that step. And today I'm going to invite you to become a volunteer like Isaiah who says yes before you even know what you're saying yes to. One of those volunteers who lived with a vision to spread good news that um, is just a a giant in my life, in my time here at Plain City, is Farrell Crago, um, who passed away about about 10 years ago now. And uh, Farrell was a man who had been undone and remade by God's grace. And um, I love watching Farrell in action. He was sometimes a little bit mischievous, stealing purses and such, but he had this gift for connecting people um, and inviting people and making them feel welcomed and loved. And so he would invite people like crazy to church. And when they showed up, uh, nobody could show up. This would have been our old building without being greeted by Farrell because he was a man on a mission. He wanted people to, to be enveloped by the love of Jesus. Uh, he, he wanted to spread good news, and he was on a mission to do that. Now, here's something ironic about Pharaoh. Um, somebody that was on such a mission 
when we would stand to sing, what would you expect? Like enthusiastic, exuberant singing? Pat's kind of laughing because she knows. Farrell didn't like to sing. And most Sundays I'd look out and he'd just stand in there. Like he didn't sing a lot. He didn't like singing in general. I don't know that it mattered a whole lot what kind of music it was. But you know what? Not once did Pharaoh ever come to me and complain about the music or having too much songs. You know why? Because he was a man on a mission to spread good news. And so personal preferences take a back seat when we are people who are volunteering to serve a mission to spread good news. What a, what a beautiful picture of somebody who had been undone and remade and then unleashed on a mission. That, that's what volunteers look like because it's not about what I want or what I prefer, but it's like there's people that need to get connected to Jesus and I want to be a part of that no matter what it takes. Volunteers live with this vision to serve and it's a serving that happens uh, when we scatter into our community and when we gather. Now, we as a community, um, I'll just tell you, this congregation You are amazing when it comes to serving in our community. Um, Whether it's DNA or the Hope Center or giving blood or serving at Lift Learning Center or mentoring people or being involved in local or regional mission kind of things. Like, we are a community that serves. And we talk a lot about when you go to work, when you go to school, when you're on the field, when you're in the locker room, what's it look like to be somebody who is a follower of Christ, who is serving in all of those places. But what I want to invite us to think about today is how we serve when we gather. Because we, we are servants, so when we scatter, we serve. But sometimes there's this uh, misunderstanding for followers of Jesus about why it is that we gather. When we gather, we expect to encounter God. We expect to experience transformation in our lives. We expect to be challenged and taught and get into scripture together. But when we gather, it is also prime time for us to gather as those who are servants, right? We gather to serve because this is a a time when we get to connect people in our community who are far from Christ. And we're gonna do that when we're out there serving, but we also have the chance to do that every time we gather. So that this gathering is not about me or my preferences or only what I'm going to get out of it. It's about connecting people to the good news that we have received in Jesus, that they might be connected to new life. And so I want to invite us to think about that. Like, how do we we gather? Do, Do we gather more as, and this is a continuum, nobody is all one or the other, right? Do we gather more as a consumer or more as a volunteer? Right Now, none of us can be 100% not consumer because you're human, right? And w- we, we do. Like if I got up here and uh, I hadn't prepared to preach and I was just like, oh, this is a good scripture, right? Um, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't show up because we're consuming a message and a worship experience. We are consumers to some extent, but on that continuum, do I gather as a, do I gather as a servant? who is contributing, not just looking at what what I'm going to gain, but what am I going to give, not just looking at how am I connecting to God, but how am I going to help somebody else get connected to Jesus and to community so that they can experience transformation in their journey. So what's, what's that look like for each of us when we gather? Here, here's the big thing um, when it comes to volunteers, um, volunteers like Isaiah, to be clear, We've been undone and remade and then unleashed, and so we serve. And this church is full of people who have just kind of come to the the recognition and kind of embraced the joy of we serve. As members of Journey Community Church, that's what we do. As followers of Jesus, that's just what we do. We serve. And you can see those who kind of engage as volunteers, one of the, all of us have reasons not to serve. Do we all agree with that? Like we heard last week from some of our next-gen servants, um, Chris and Connie and Brody shared last week. And guess what? They all have busy lives and they can think of lots of reasons not to serve. We all do. But here's one of the things that you'll find in those of us that are, are volunteering. Instead of making excuses, we just make a way. 
just make a way. Like we rearrange schedules, we, we make a commitment to do it. We, we're, we embrace the, the uh, inconvenience of it because we're living for a vision that is bigger than ourselves, right? To spread good news, for people to experience new life in Jesus. And we've been talking about this for, for four weeks, really, the vision of, of, of seeing God and knowing that, like, if we've encountered this God, this holy God who embraces us by his grace, then we've experienced something that every human being on the planet needs. Like everybody, and this is this free gift that Jesus offers. And the reality is that he's going to do it through Chris and Wes and Don. He's going to do it through Tina and through Scott. I said Scott because you get like five people if you say the name Scott in this room, right? Uh, he's going to do it through us to spread this good news. And we have a vision to reach people in this community with the good news of Jesus. And what we need is some people to say, pick me. I'm all in. And like w what's amazing about Isaiah is he hears the, the Lord say, uh, who, who will go for us? Who, who can we send? And before he knows the job description, he volunteers, right? How many of us do that, right? Uh, usually, myself included, right? If I get asked to do something, like the district sends out an email, we need volunteers to do this. I'm like, how often? How much time, right? Um, it, it's kind of human, right? But, but Isaiah shows us a different way. He just says yes first, and then waits to see what God says next, right? Yes first, I'm all in. I want to be a part of what you're doing. I was, uh, in a, I was actually listening to a podcast this week, and a passage of scripture jumped out at me in a completely new way that uh, I never thought about this before. So this is a little bit of a tangent in the message, but follow me to John chapter 2. John chapter 2 is Jesus doing his first miracle in the gospel of John. Anybody know what that is? Changes water into wine. Anybody want some of that Jesus in your world? Right? Okay, all right. Uh, so he changes water into wine. But here's what jumped out at me in this passage of Scripture. If you read it, and feel free to skim it right now. So they're at a wedding, and the, the hosts of the party run out of wine, which was a shameful thing in the culture of that day. And so Jesus' mother, Mary, goes to Jesus and says, Hey, can you help out? Can you fix this? And Jesus um, gives her a very polite but firm no, which is really interesting. He says no. And then Mary's response um, is this powerful statement in John chapter 2, verse 4. After he says no, she, uh, this is what it says exactly, but his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. You know what we call that? They were voluntold, right? Anybody, has that ever happened in your life? They were voluntold. They didn't volunteer. They were voluntold, do whatever Jesus tells you to do. Now, here's the, the beautiful thing in this story. If you read it down, down this passage, I'll read a little bit for us. Um, so they do. There's some jars nearby. They fill the jars with water because Jesus tells them to fill the jars with water. Um, and then Jesus says, uh, this is verse 8, now dip some out, take it to the master of ceremonies. So the servants followed his instructions. They're just the servants. They just did what Jesus told them to do. When the master of the ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from. Now, this is the line I love. Not knowing where it had come from, and then in parentheses it says, though, of course, the servants knew. He called the bridegroom over. A host always serves the best wine first, he said. Then when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out less expensive wine, but you have kept the best until now. This miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Here's, here's why I'm telling that story. Why, why would you want to serve? Why would you want to be inconvenienced and sacrifice your time and effort? Uh, why would you want to risk being tackled by children in the nursery or preschool ministry room? Why, why would you do that? There's a lot of reasons, 
And we've been talking for four weeks that when we're undone and remade by God's grace, that's enough right there. That's a why. Because I, I have to share this grace that I've received. And I hope that for a lot of us, that why right there is, that's just enough. But here's another reason why. When we are willing, voluntold or volunteering, to do whatever Jesus tells us to do, we get to be on the front lines of God doing the miraculous and God's glory being revealed. Like right there. Like we get to see lives changed and, and marriages put back together and, and kids to have that moment when the light bulb goes off and they, they choose to trust in Jesus. We get to be there in the thick of life we get to be there like uh, we can tell the story. Um, uh, last week, Brody shared a little bit about wh- when he first uh, connected with our church. We were doing the um, Christmas Under the Clock downtown. And some of you in the room were probably serving that night and you were helping with crafts. Like, you get to know when Brody was up here sharing about how God is working in him and serving and, and all of this stuff, like you were part of the story because you showed up to serve that night. Like, you're, you're like... You get the inside track to see God's power and God's glory revealed. You get to see the miraculous. I mean, these servants that were voluntold, all they did was put some water in some jars, and Jesus took something ordinary and did something miraculous. That's what happens when we volunteer to do whatever Jesus asks us to do. He takes the ordinary, like passing a bulletin out to somebody, or or cuddling a a baby in our nursery, or or cleaning up some toy equipment after the kids have left for the day, or playing a piano, or singing a song, or mowing the lawn. There's a lot of it to mow. He takes the ordinary, and it becomes something miraculous. It gets to be part of, because everything that we do, like when we serve as a gathered community, it's not about the task that's getting done right in front of us, It's about knowing that when we serve in any way, we're a part of this bigger vision, a vision bigger than ourselves that is connecting people to new life in Jesus. 